Welcome to everyone again to our Sunday evening worship and uh, I trust that your hearts are encouraged. And now we remind ourselves about the series that we are in, which is Standing on the Promises of God. Difficult to forget because we sing the song every Sunday. I have a question for you. How has the reading and the listening of Joshua, listening to Joshua, how has it impacted your life? Would you like to reflect for a moment on that? We have already completed four parts to this series. And as we have been reading through the book, we could ask ourselves, Lord, how has this book begun to impact me? This historical book tells the story of how God uh, actualized the promises that he made to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you go back to Genesis and read through those patriarchal stories from Genesis 12, you will find that God repeatedly tells them, I will give you the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and so on. And God tells that to Abraham, he repeats it to him several times, then he tells it to Isaac, he repeats it, then he tells it to Jacob and he repeats it. So you never miss the point that God had promised them the land. But that promise was also bound to the fact that the people who lived in the land were living ungodly lives in, in a way that was totally displeasing to God. And so in Genesis 16, God says to Abraham that he will bring back the Israelites from captivity because the sin of the Amorites have not yet reached its fulfillment. God was bringing Israel as a means of punishing a nation or a group of nations that had failed God so badly. Every nation is accountable to God, and God uses many different ways to punish and judge nations. Now, the promise that God gave Abraham of giving his descendants the land, it wasn't fulfilled in 50 years. It wasn't even fulfilled in 100 years. When you think about it, Joshua comes only about 600 to 700 years after the promise was first issued. So when we say standing on the promises of God, we also must remember that it doesn't mean that God answers it instantly. His promises are sure, but he will answer it at the time that he sees best for us. And so we remind ourselves that promises are not fulfilled always instantly. But the promises also weren't fulfilled because God did everything. God had made the promise, but he wasn't going to give it all to Joshua and the Israelites on a platter. It was always a collaboration between God and the people of Israel. Joshua was told in chapter 1, now it's the time, but you must stand and be courageous and go in and take the land. But as they took those steps, God honored their obedience. And what a wonderful thing for us to learn from that. That we too will enter into the promises of God only as we take the steps of obedience that we were reminded of throughout the series last week we remembered how they were obedient to go and take the, uh, the city of Jericho and trust God's methods and God honored them. And a third thing, and finally, the promise wasn't immune from human error. And so this week, Reverend Dulip is here to share with us the passage that was read to us which, in which we learn that uh, what can happen when we get out of sync with God. The promises are not immune from human error and they can suffer greatly because of the things we do in, disobe in disobedience to God. So we're very grateful to those who are preaching this series and now we welcome Reverend Dulip who will lead us and uh, share God's word with us. <coughs> we read two uh, weeks ago of the Jews overcoming Jericho. The Israelites marched around Jericho seven days, and on the seventh day, they marched seven times and blew a trumpet and shouted, and the walls of Jericho fell. The armies of Israel devastated the city and destroyed all its inhabitants. One wonders, did God intend this massacre? Jericho was a wild city child sacrifices, human sacrifices, sacred prostitutes in the temple that connected them with their gods, multiple gods, all in, in, engaging in different acts of immorality. 
extreme levels of perversity and violence. God called Israel to be a holy people, a people who would be a model society that can reflect the kingdom of God. This could never happen if they were to live among so people who were so perverse and evil. So sadly, God destroyed these people. And the spoils of that victory, the gold, silver, belonged to God. They devote, devoted it to him. And uh, it was to go into the treasury. Otherwise, it would defile God's people. So, the spoils of that victory belong to God, and no one can use those spoils for themselves. The next city to be conquered was I. And that was 10 miles uh, away from Jericho. And as was usual, spies were sent to this city. And these spies came and said that there's only a small population, 3,000 people will be enough to destroy this city. They greatly underestimated the strength of I. So Israel attacked I with just 3,000 soldiers, and they were badly beat. They were chased back to their camp, and they lost 36 people from the Jewish army. As we heard, Joshua was distraught. He prostrated himself with his people before God and asked, why, Lord, why has this happened? The Canaanites will destroy us now, and your name you will become a laughing stock and your name will be dishonored. God answers, Israel has disobeyed God. They have broken the covenant, the covenant that said he will be their God and they will be his people and obey him. They have defiled the camp by stealing gold and silver in Jericho gold and silver that belong to God. The God who fought for Israel now fought against Israel. And sin had to be removed if the hedge of protection that God had over Israel was to remain. The relationship was broken. Yet, God gives a promise. He will restore this relationship if sin is removed. He will renew his covenant if you re root out the sin from the camp. So we find that there is a culprit who has removed all this uh, gold and silver from Jericho. And at that time, casting lots was the way in which they discerned the will of God. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to guide them. They didn't have the word of God to help them. They didn't have prophets who will reveal the will of God. So, they had to use these, these lots, casting lots, to find out uh, who is guilty and who is not. And they found out the culprit. It was Achan from the tribe of Judah. He never confessed his sin till he was confronted. And it was only then that he confessed his sin. He says he saw a Babylonian garment and he coveted it. He saw the gold and silver devoted to God, and he stole it. He saw what he saw, and when he saw it, desire was born. Greed took over. He stole and hid this loot and thought he can get away with his deceit. But God saw it. He exposed him, and his family and the whole nation of Israel suffered because of his sin. He had to be punished for his deliberate act of disobedience of God's law. Because sin had to be removed from that camp. So Achan was stoned to death. Sadly, his children too, did they collaborate in his foul deed? His wife was spared. Or was she not there? Did she not conspire with her husband to do this sin? We don't know. But one man's sin 
affected whole families and the whole nation. This man had to be removed for the covenant to be renewed and the relationship with God to be restored. And when this was done, God came back to Israel. He fought with them. They attacked Ai and destroyed it. They hanged its king. And Israel won a victory and captured Ai. This is our story. What do we learn from it? How do these Old Testament stories apply to our life? I want to make five points. The first is that God is a holy God. He does not tolerate sin. Sin breaks our relationship with him. He is of pure eyes and can behold iniquity. Sometimes we wonder why Christians are all the time talking about sin. Other religions don't major on sin in the same that we do. Radha Krishnan once, the great Hindu philosopher once said, it is a sin to call a man a sinner. We Christians, we come to church and we say we are miserable sinners. We confess our sin and we ask God to search our hearts and expose our sin. Secondly, we see a God of justice punishes sin. And that's not a popular conception of God. But sin is abhorrent to God. It denies his holiness. God judges sin and he acts against the sinner. He breaks his relationship with the sinner. If you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. Right through the Bible we see this. His judgment on sin. He puts down the mighty from their seat, those who are proud and arrogant, and he exalts the humble and meek. Today, men have lost the fear of God because God has been patient with the sinner. His punishments are not given immediately, nor are they visible. And so we take God for granted and think he ignores sin. But he will judge sin, either in this world or in the next. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? If he does not punish sin, he will not be a judge who sees that justice is done. If Hitler and Stalin and all these mass murderers, if all the people who have caused death, destruction and suffering to people are not judged and punished for sin, what kind of world will this be? What kind of God will God be? Often, unlike Achan, people are not punished on earth for the sins they have done. But there will be punishment beyond the grave, or at least at the last judgment. Even Buddhism speaks of sin, or what they call akusai, which is caused, uh, which causes bad karma and which causes punishment either in this world or in the next world. This is inevitable and unavoidable. You have to pay for your sin. We agree with them. But our problem is, can an impersonal force called karma keep moral accounts? Can it give punishment for bad and rewards for good? either in this birth, or as they say, in the next birth. How can an impersonal force decide on moral evil? Morality belongs to the realm of personality. Just as the sun, or the tsunamis, or the floods, which are great powers, impersonal powers, don't discriminate between good and bad, and affect only the bad. You need a personal power to judge moral behavior. You need an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, personal God to see sin and punish it. God is the judge. We sometimes don't understand the severity or the immediacy of that punishment because our vision is confined to the limits of time. We can't see eternity and what God will do through eternity. But God has eternity to work out his justice. And we know that he will be just in his punishments. Then we see, thirdly, the dangers of covetousness. 
how we need to heed the warnings of scripture against covetousness the dangers of money the greed for silver and gold Achan saw a Babylonian garment he saw silver and gold and instead of controlling what he saw desire was born in his heart desire led to greed greed led to stealing and stealing made him hide what he stole be careful little eyes what you see is a little chorus that we once used to sing Eve saw that apple and it looked good and he, she took it and tasted it and brought the whole human race into a fallen condition David saw that beautiful woman he saw with his eyes that beautiful woman bathing and instead of turning aside he let his eyes feast on that woman's beauty and she ended up in adultery how often what we see if we don't control it it causes so much problems oh today we know that tv and mobile phones and all internet with so much porn in it makes people addicted to this porn because they can't control their eyes it destroys their lives it distorts our vision of reality of righteousness of love let us not ignore the warnings of scripture be careful what your eyes see but also we must not ignore the warnings on the lure uh, the the lust for wealth money is needed for our existence for our development but money can become our god that's what the scriptures say we can love our money more than god we can love put our faith on our money more than god we can find our security in our money more than our security in god we can serve the interests of money more than we serve god jesus said your life does not consist of the abundance of your possessions life cannot be spent on getting more and more for ourselves thinking it is the only way in which we can have happiness and security god called the man a fool because he put his whole security on wealth and when he was called to return to his maker he went like a pauper because he owned nothing more than the money that he had to leave behind at death he can stole what belonged to god and we too can steal what belongs to god our money belongs to god he gives us the intelligence he gives us the abilities he gives us the good health he gives us parents who give us so much help and money he gives us the uh, the opportunities he gives us the education so that we can make money and we rob god when we use our money selfishly just gratifying our desires enjoying the pleasures and luxuries of life forgetting that god's gifts are to be shared are to are meant to serve people so many use their money on useless things getting things that they don't need often as a symbol of their status often to give them an image in society they waste their money on unnecessary luxuries when so many people in society don't even have their basic necessities when there is so much hunger and poverty in this country and in this world we selfishly use our resources resources just on ourselves for our entertainment and pleasure so much christian work can be done if christian people give sacrificially to mission recently we were uh, interviewing um, a young couple uh, to become evangelists in our church and they had all the qualifications they had their a levels they were very uh, capable people and we thought they would make a very good couple in the life of the church but when we told them what the salary was to be an evangelist or to be an evangelist in training they said we can't manage 
on 15,000 a month. We have two children. How can we live on that <coughs> stipend? We thank God that there are still people who are willing to sacrifice and take up that challenge by faith. But on our part, are we being fair by these people to offer that kind of allowance when there are so many challenges in this country? And we are doing this because people are not giving enough for mission. We thank God for those who give sacrificially, those who use their resources to provide employment to people, who use their resources so that widows and orphans and aged people are cared for, who educate the poor, who see that the resources of this land are equitably distributed, who give sacrificially for God's work. But let us see the warnings of scripture, the love of money is the root of all evil. John Wesley once said, earn all you can. Honestly, of course, earn all you can. There's nothing wrong in that. Then he said, save all you can. Don't waste what you have earned on just trifles and useless things. And then he said, not just save all you can to have a big bank balance. Give all you can so that people are blessed. Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can so that people are blessed. And the fourth thing that we see here is that be sure your sin will find you out. We often think that we can sin and get away with it. Achan thought that God did not see what he had done, but he realized that God saw, and his sin was exposed. All we have done will one day be exposed. I have a friend who was a diver and he was in the Navy and he used to dive and uh, uh, examine sunken ships and see if there was anything worthwhile that he could uh, take from that ship and give it to the Navy. And one day he uh, dived right down and uh, went into a ship and he went into one of the cabins and then the door that uh, uh, he, uh, of that cabin got jammed and he couldn't open it. And his oxygen supply was gradually finishing and he was finding it difficult to breathe and he thought he was going to be unconscious. And then just before he lost consciousness or he thought he was going to lose consciousness, he saw his whole life going before him. Like on a screen, he could see all the things he had done from the time he was small. All the wrong things and the good things that he had done. And he realized that everything is recorded. As Revelation says, everything is written in that book of life. That book where our deeds are recorded. And he realized that nothing is hidden, nothing is lost. Thankfully, he suddenly found that there was like a hand that pushed him up to the roof of that, uh, of that cabin. And there he saw a little trap door which he was able to push and get out. And he was a Hindu then, but he soon became a Christian. And he realized that God had saved him for a purpose. And he goes around telling others of the wonder of God's love. It will be revealed somewhere in this world and if not in this world in the next world this is why we come to church to confess our sin god reveals even our secret sins in this place of worship because the holy spirit if he is active he convicts us of our sin we say search me O god and show me the sin in my life we are in church people don't like when people talk too much about sin. But here in this church, we comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable, as someone has put it. So, we need to look at our lives, to repent of our sin, to see those secret sins that are there in our life. And that's why 
the Holy Spirit works in our church. Sin often affects others. Our families, our society, our nation, our individual sin can cause collective sin and collective disaster. We don't sin in isolation. There is a community solidarity among people and one person's sin affects the other because we are all interconnected. And that's what Achan found. Achan's sin affected his family, it affected Israel, and by bringing it into the camp, it contaminated the whole camp of Israel. You can see it in our own land, how the sins of leaders, how the sins of people has brought this land to a point of disaster. We think we sin in isolation, but sin affects our families and our societies. Illicit relationships causes broken homes and delinquent children. Alcohol causes poverty, illness, and deprives families of the resources that are rightly theirs and causes so many road accidents. I know a young man whose father uh, gave up uh, his mother, who left his mother, and uh, went with another woman. And this young man, a clever boy, was so discouraged that he gave up his education and he took to drugs. And he was an embarrassment to the whole family. And he nearly destroyed his life and the lives of that family. Achan, he sinned. And so many people suffered because of his sin. Sin must be removed if there is going to be blessing. Sin must be removed if you are to renew your covenant and restore the relationship with God. So our sins must be removed if God is going to act in our life. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. So a radical removal of sin is necessary. That young man, through his life, he went on taking drugs. But one day he met Jesus Christ and he realized that this is not the way that he should be going. And he was delivered from his sin. He wasn't a Christian then, but he became a follower of Jesus. And his sin was removed and he became a new person. And today he is the director of a drug rehabilitation center where hundreds of people are being rehabilitated and also exposed to the truth of the gospel, the power that is available to those who put their trust in Jesus. We can't end on that note. This is a series on the promises of God. We saw when sin was removed, grace took over. The covenant was renewed. God was with his people again. His promises were fulfilled and they battled against I again and conquered I this time. We are seen abounds. Grace can much more abound if we let God's promises be fulfilled in our life and we remove our sin. God promises to forgive sin. His grace will restore the sinner. It was true, Achan's sin brought devastation for Israel. Just as Adam's sin brought de devastation to all mankind. Romans 5, verses 16 onwards, it says, One man's sin brought sin and condemnation to all. One man's act of righteousness brought justification and righteousness to all. The righteousness the, of Jesus brought justification and forgiveness to all. One man's disobedience made many people sinners, but the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, made many righteous. That's the promise that Jesus Christ gives to us. He bore our sin on that cross. He took the penalty and the punishment that a just God determined that sin should bear. But God was not only just, he is a God of love, and a loving God sent his son to bear that punishment for sin so that we can be forgiven, 
so that we can be delivered from sin, so that we can have salvation. One day all my sins will be revealed, my secret sins, my motives, my thoughts, my actions. And if the devil is allowed to come to the judgment seat of Christ, the devil will accuse and say, this man cannot be admitted to heaven because he has done all these things. But I know my Savior will come and say, I died for him. I gave my life for him. I bore the penalty for his sin. Now his sins and iniquities I will remember no more. He trusted in me. He gave his life to me. He is an heir of eternal life. And heaven is his heritage. Oh, that's the marvelous grace of our loving God. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. There was a Catholic priest who has now been canonized. He was a prisoner of war in a Southeast Asian a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And these prisoners, hundreds of them, were given shovels and they had to spend all their time uh, digging up various places where they were sent to. And with these shovels, they had to clean up, they had to throw the dirt away, they had to fill up uh, all sorts of pits uh, with the shovel. But one day at the end of the day, the camp commander counted the shovels and found that one shovel was missing. And he shouted at the people and said, at the prisoners and said, one of these shovels are missing. And unless one, someone confesses that he has taken this shovel and hidden it somewhere, I am going to shoot ten people every day till I find that shovel. And he said, I will start now unless someone confesses to stealing this shovel and hiding it somewhere. No one was willing to confess. And then he brought his gun and was about to shoot ten people in that camp. And this Catholic priest then said, I stole it. You can shoot me. And that priest was shot and killed. The next day they counted the shovels and they found that they were all there. That a man had made a mistake when he counted the shovels. The Catholic priest was willing to die so that the others can be saved. Oh, that's what Jesus did for us. He died so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be saved, so that we can have eternal life, so that our sin can be removed. But he not only died, he rose again. And he lives in us. He removes our sin. He gives us victory over sin. He makes us his covenant people. And we are his people. If we put him first and obey him. And that's the challenge to us today. The door of salvation is open. We are saved by his grace. If only we trust him and we give our lives to him. That's the way to victory, of renewing our covenant with God, of renewing our relationship with God, of removing the sin that is in our life so that we can be forgiven, so that we can become the children of God, so that we can be heirs of eternal life. Do you have it? Do you know that Savior? Do you have the assurance that he is in your life? That you have a personal relationship with God. That's the challenge that I want to place before you. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for your grace, a grace that is greater than all our sin. What a privilege it is 
to belong to you, to know this wonderful truth that our Savior died for us on that cruel cross, taking upon himself the sin of the world so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be saved. Lord, we know we cannot continue in sin. We have to repent of our sin and turn to him and ask him to forgive us and cleanse us and become our Lord, our Savior, our King. We pray that if there is anyone here who has not done it, we pray that today will be the day of their salvation. As the Lord taps, knocks at the hearts, at the door of their hearts, may they open it and say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I have sinned. There are so many secret sins that I am hiding. Hiding from God and from the world. I am willing to open my heart's door to remove those sins and let Jesus Christ be the Lord of my life. Lord, we pray that you will help us to give our lives to you so that you can use us and so that we can be children of the covenant, heirs of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.